show your support. Like, share and subscribe. Hello, I am That British Guy and welcome back to The Raw After. Specifically, this time we are looking at the Raw After Money in the Bank 2011. That famous night in Chicago where CM Punk beat John Cena in a five-star classic and ran away with the WWE title. How would Vince and WWE respond now that their champion had absconded with the title because he was no longer under contract? Well, let's find out, shall we? We have Michael Cole and Jerry the King Lawler on commentary. And immediately they're putting over what a kind of unusual night this is. King mentions it here and does repeatedly throughout the night, calls it uncharted waters. The show opens with Vince McMahon and John Laurinaitis coming out to the ring. And the first thing that Vince does is basically cuts down the fairly minimal CM Punk chants. He explains to the crowd that you will never hear him say that name ever again. He nullifies the championship win of the night before. And because at the moment they are without a champion, they are going to have an eight-man tournament to decide the new WWE Champion. And that tournament is going to basically last throughout the entire night with the main event being the final and come the end of the night we will crown a new WWE Champion. Spoiler, we don't actually crown a new WWE Champion, but more on that later. It's nice and succinct, it lasts all of about five minutes he gets in there about the fact that John Cena let him down and that there's going to be severe consequences for him. We kind of explain what is going to be happening with the title in this tournament and obviously the CM Punk element there, at least from a corporate standpoint. It's lovely and succinct and it gets over so much in so little time. Why don't they do this anymore? Why do they need to take 20 minutes at the beginning of an episode to explain what happened at the pay-per-view last night? What's going to be coming up that night? All these kind of different ramifications and usually it's sort of repeating the same bits of information again and again and again. One more thing to note on this opening segment is a little bit of foreshadowing where Vince McMahon, when he's referring to John Cena, Claims that no one man is bigger than the WWE. Remember that for later. Anyway, after this short promo, we go straight into our first tournament match. The Miz taking on Alex Riley. Now, most of these guys that are involved in this tournament were in the Money in the Bank ladder match. In fact, the only person who was in the ladder match that isn't in this tournament is Evan Bourne. And the only person who's in this tournament that wasn't in the ladder match is United States champion Dolph Ziggler. And the Miz comes out and he is selling a knee injury from the ladder match. Bit weird, seeing as he's a heel and you're kind of painting him as this sympathetic underdog fighting with an injury, especially as his first opponent is his former protege, who he completely screwed over. Very, very strange. Anyway, Alex Riley does, as you would suspect, target the knee repeatedly. It's a very controlled and measured attack on that, and it is very, very well done. It is a shame that Alex Riley did not last longer in the WWE. I remember at the time being sort of very excited when he finally broke away from The Miz to see what he would be able to accomplish in the future. Potentially some mid-card titles, maybe even forming some kind of tag team with somebody else in the mid-card and seeing what would happen there. But his legs were cut from under him very, very quickly. Also, his theme music was proper quality. I do love me a bit of Alex Riley's theme song. But, nah, never mind. We get what looks like a kind of drive-by from Alex Riley after he gets dumped out of the ring. And towards the end of the match, he administers a Texas Cloverleaf hold. And he does a very good job of it. 
and he does such a good job of it that Michael Cole claims that it looks like some sort of sharpshooter. Well, it kind of looks a bit like a sharpshooter, Cole, but it looks more like a Texas cloverleaf, because that's what it actually is, you prat. The finish of the match sees Miz get kind of thrown into the corner. There's this weird kind of blocking issue, I think, where Alex Riley was meant to get kind of blocked off by the referee, so he has to kind of hide behind the referee, and then gets blindsided by the Miz, hit by a skull-crushing finale, and the Miz advances through to the next round. We then get a quick video package for John Morrison because he is due to be returning after a layoff with injury. And then we go into the R-Truth versus Jack Swagger match. This is probably the weirdest match of the tournament. R-Truth very much definitely a heel. This was kind of the biggest push up into the main card he ever received. This is only sort of a month or so after he faced John Cena at Capital Punishment for the WWE title. This is his whole kind of little Jimmy shtick that he was doing at the time and coming out to no music as well, which was very weird. And then on the other side, we have Jack Swagger wrestling in a very kind of cocky, arrogant manner. I'm guessing he's meant to be the face, but no one really is getting behind him as a face character. And the way he is wrestling is very heelish. And because of that, the crowd really can't get into it because there's no one to cheer for, or at least no one that they care about to cheer for. And you can tell how much the company cares about this match because the commentators spend the entirety talking about John Cena and The Rock and Wrestlemania main event at Wrestlemania 28 and the fact that that might be in jeopardy because John Cena is convinced that he is going to get fired later in the night. They bring up this whole hashtag of Save Cena and the fact that there's been a lot of buzz on Twitter to try and keep John Cena in his job and then they occasionally mention oh yeah there's a match still going on. Right at the end of the match Jack Swagger goes for the ankle lock, bearing in mind he has spent pretty much none of the match focusing in on the ankle or the leg or anything of R-Truth, but he goes to lock on the ankle lock, R-Truth rolls through and kind of sits down on him and gets the sneaky victory. So we have two heels winning in the first two matches, so it's pretty obvious who's going to be winning the next two matches, isn't it people? The next match sees the Money in the Bank ladder match winner, Alberto Del Rio, taking on Kofi Kingston. Now, before the match starts, Del Rio gets a little bit of time on the mic and basically berates John Cena and says he hopes he gets fired for what he's done and also berates Punk for running away because the previous night Del Rio tried to cash in money in the bank in order to win the title before CM Punk ran away and he basically calls him a coward for doing so. Before the match starts we also see the return of Ricardo Rodriguez, the ring announcer for Del Rio. I'm presuming he was away with an injury of some sort and he returns here. This is a little bit more lively than the previous match. There's a lot more fire to it. Obviously, Kofi Kingston with his kind of high flying and quick offense is kind of a better character for the crowd to get behind and will on. He does a lovely dive onto Del Rio on the outside fairly early on. But unfortunately, Cole and King are still locked in their Cena and Rock conversation and worrying about those two guys and Wrestlemania and all that shtick. Heaven forbid we could actually focus in on a match here for the WWE title tournament that had just been set up. No, no, it is clear that the title is, in this instance, just a prop and just an excuse for a series of matches. The more important thing to be worrying about here is Wrestlemania's main event between one guy who supposedly is going to be fired later in the night and another guy who doesn't even really properly work for the company anymore. Cool. Thanks for telling me what to bother to care about. Unfortunately, the end of the match sees basically the same pattern as the previous match, so far in the finish basically being a carbon copy. 
Del Rio goes for a rolling armbar. Again, he has barely worked over Kofi Kingston's arm, but hey, I've got a lock on the armbar because that's my finishing move. And Kofi kind of misses initially, but does manage to, with some help from Del Rio, roll Del Rio up and get the surprise victory. It's time to remind everyone that SummerSlam is only a few weeks away, so we have a SummerSlam recall segment. And this just shows kind of a bit of the build and the finish to the British Bulldog versus Bret Hart main event SummerSlam 1992 match for the Intercontinental title at Wembley Stadium. Not really anything to say here, apart from the fact that for my shame, I still am yet to see that match all the way through. Maybe I will do that once I have finished recording and editing this video. Once that has finished, we get a quick Kofi Kingston interview. And he says that he was in that ladder match the previous night and he came short. But today is a new day. Although he doesn't say it like that, unfortunately. And this is his chance to be the W. W.E. Champion! Again, unfortunately, he doesn't say it like that. And we also have to wait eight years for that to actually be a reality. Moving on. We have the final first round match now between Rey Mysterio and Dolph Ziggler. Now, as I said earlier, Ziggler was the only guy in this tournament who wasn't in the ladder match. So, realistically, that should sort of favour him here. Also, he is the only singles champion on Raw at the moment, so we're going to need to kind of make him look strong here, aren't we? They have probably the best match of the night, definitely the best first round match. Couple of early spots, there's a lovely kind of throwing Rey Mysterio like a lawn dart out of the ring, and you kind of expect him to just land flat. He manages to roll through that and stand up, but then Ziggler just slams him down onto the outside. It's quite brutal looking. We do get a very kind of weird looking leg lock hold on Rey Mysterio. I'm not really quite sure what Dolph Ziggler's trying to do here, but... Eh. We also later on see him bust out what is now known as natural selection. I don't really remember Dolph Ziggler doing this move very often. Um, you certainly don't really see him doing it now. I guess because Charlotte's around, nobody's really allowed to do it now. Although, having said that, she doesn't really use it anymore, unfortunately. We get a failed 619 attempt where Dolph Ziggler manages to just at the last second duck underneath the kick. And looks like he's about to kind of surprise Rey Mysterio for the win. But Rey Mysterio works back into a 619 strike and a splash for the clean win. Okay, so in the first round, we've managed to let an underdog heel character with a gammy knee get through. We've also managed to beat the US champion and the holder of the Money in the Bank briefcase. Cool. And we also decided to have a match between effectively two heel characters, neither of which the crowd are really behind, so yeah, weird so far. Anyway, it is now time for a piss break match. Yes, it is a seven on seven Divas match. Oh dear Christ. Okay. On the face side of things, we have the Divas Champion, Kelly Kelly, and she is partnering with Beth Phoenix, Natalia, Caitlin, AJ Lee, Eve Torres, and Gail Kim, who I was really surprised was still in the company at uh, 2011, but there you go. And they are facing off against the heel team of the Bella Twins, Melina, Maurice, Tamina, Alicia Fox and Rosa Mendez. Oh dear God. So the match itself, if you can call it that, is basically Beth Phoenix versus Rosa Mendez. Immediately there is a botch from Rosa not knowing what Beth is trying to do. It looks like some kind of slam 
or maybe she's even going for a guillotine, and Rosa Mendes just falls on her ass. There is a very, very quick cover, which is broken up by the Bellas. That then descends into just seven on seven chaos, or rather six on six chaos on the outside. And Beth Phoenix very quickly hits the glam slam for the win. And even Michael Cole says, thank goodness that lasted 30 seconds. Yep, you are correct for once in your life, Michael Cole. Thank Christ that did not go any longer. What in the blue hell was any of that? So we have our first semi-finals match. Kofi Kingston versus The Miz. And obviously The Miz's knee got worked over even more by Alex Riley in the first round. So he is selling that even more here. So you've got kind of crowd favourite, high-flying, fast-paced, fun, exciting Kofi Kingston taking on a kind of conniving, detestable heel in The Miz, who was brilliant at that character, but you're going to give The Miz the kind of kayfabe knee injury and the kind of valiant, can he rise above his injury to beat the evil Kofi Kingston bit of this storyline. It just, it makes no sense whatsoever. Why on earth did they have to go with this for the Miz. You could have just had him sneakily winning against guys. You could have given the knee injury to Alex Riley and that be why he lost to the Miz in the first round. Bearing in mind at Capital Punishment a month or so ago, Alex Riley had just broken free of the Miz and beat him on pay-per-view. You could have even given that injury to Rey Mysterio as soon as his knees are knackered anyway. But no, let's give that to the heel character. Yes! Excellent storytelling. Anyway, we get nice shades of Tyler Bate here from uh, Kofi Kingston right at the beginning of the match. Kofi in 2011 must be watching a lot of NXT UK on the network. Obviously, Kofi Kingston, even though he is a face, is going to be targeting this leg. And he does for the majority of the match. Because, obviously, The Miz is having to work a much slower pace, it's not quite as exciting and frenetic as Kofi's first match. There is a little bit of a scare with a crossbody, and that kind of gets rolled through. We've seen that a million times, where the person actually who initiates the move ends up getting pinned. There's no pin here, although it does come very, very close. And we get a lucky escape towards the end. Kofi is going for Trouble in Paradise, and The Miz rolls out. He then kind of guillotines Kofi on the top rope. It looks like The Miz is then going to sneak in with a skull crushing finale, but that gets kind of pushed off. He gets pushed into the corner. However, he uses this to his advantage and kind of snake eyes Kofi onto the top turnbuckle. He then does hit skull crushing finale and makes his way into the final. That valiant underdog, The Miz, with his gammy knee is in the final. Yay! Woohoo for the heel character that nobody likes. Doesn't make any sense. We then get a very, very nice and intense R-Truth interview backstage, basically saying that he has been kept away from the title because of conspiracies. He is the most deserving person in this tournament. And you could maybe make a claim for that because he's the guy in the tournament that last had a main event title match for the belt. And basically nobody is going to be keeping him away from this title any longer. We get a very, very quick video package from our Tough Enough winner, Andy Levine. And Cole asks, oh, I wonder if he might be champion one day. No, no, he won't, Cole. He'll disappear off the face of the earth and we'll all completely forget about him. So now we have the second semi-final match and the match that actually turns out to be our main event. We don't know it yet, although technically we do now because I've just told you. Rey Mysterio taking on our truth Now this is another pretty decent match, I would say. It's very much our truth just kind of cutting down Rey Mysterio at any opportunity he gets to try and get on top. Our truth though is still quite fast paced, so it's not like we're going into kind of rest hold city here. We do get a little bit of that towards the middle of the match, 
just to kind of generate a little bit of heat but it doesn't go on too long thankfully our truth is as kind of dynamic and explosive as Rey Mysterio at times so it does manage to keep the crowd's interest throughout strangely this is the only match of the night that actually has an ad break I'm not really sure why it does have an ad break in it and equally I'm not really sure why the others managed to avoid that obviously it was just the way they kind of structured the night obviously R-Truth uses the ad break to really kind of crank on the heel slow down the match that is sort of when that happens and it continues a little bit after the ad break as well we get another failed 619 attempt this time he just gets cut off with a clothesline so that our truth can just keep working over Rey Mysterio just kind of chucking him around and slamming him every which way that he can we get a kind of weird variation of a stunner a kind of flip over and then down into the stunner position very very kind of interesting way of working that move this then leads to a rope break and kind of r-truth frustration which leads into a 619 and a splash for the win again so we have the final there of Rey Mysterio versus The Miz and you think that The Miz is going to be coming out in a minute to kind of finish off this tournament but no 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 Vince McMahon's music goes again and he basically postpones this match until next week because we're running short on time with 20 minutes left we're running short on time and he's got other things that need to be dealt with Mysterio is obviously reluctant to leave the ring and Vince kind of insists and says look this whole situation is bigger than you so just on your way please not sure whether that was a callback to what he said earlier or whether he was just, you know, short shaming Rey Mysterio. Probably a bit of both, knowing Vince. Anyway, Vince kind of starts on his little tirade and says that obviously he's got stuff that he needs to deal with regarding John Cena and the fact that he could make another John Cena overnight. And that is when the crowds start up yet another CM Punk charm. It's quite weird given what happened the night before, the fact that the crowd are so slow to get on the CM Punk chant thing, whereas now they'll chant it for seemingly any reason that they can think of, just to go, oh, we're chanting CM Punk, oh, aren't we cool? Vince then kind of blames the audience a little bit as well, and says, look, everything that I'm doing, I'm doing with your best interests. You might not always see that, you might think that I'm doing things for a certain reason, but actually I have kind of long-term intentions. Long-term? Mm. Try booking long-term, and then you can actually say that sentence with a straight face. And you might not appreciate it now, but you will come to appreciate it down the line once it is clear why I have decided to do what I do. It is at this moment he then kind of calls John Cena out, and he makes his way down to the ring and grabs a mic. And before he starts, he sort of says, look, I'm not here to run you down. I'm not going to go on a tirade about you or your family or your company. You don't need a seven second delay, Kevin. One of the few times that Kevin Dunn actually gets, you know, acknowledgement. And John Cena kind of likens his situation the previous night to what Shawn Michaels had to go through at Survivor Series 1997. He says, look... I knew what would have happened if I lost, I knew what the ramifications were, I knew that my job was on the line and that basically you wanted me to be a patsy and play ball for you and I don't do things like that. You would have made the title completely meaningless in doing that and I don't want to have to spend the rest of my career being the guy that screwed CM Punk in the same way that Sean was always the guy that screwed Brett so I'm not having that. I'm going to basically go out on my sword here and that will be the end of me. You want to fire me, feel free. Know that I feel I belong here, but if you get rid of me, I love this business and doing this more. So I will just walk onto somebody else's TV show and keep doing this over there if I'm not welcome to do that here. 
which I think if they'd have followed through with that could have been absolutely massive. What they're sort of setting up here could have been one of the biggest things in wrestling ever. And I know that everyone still talks about Money in the Bank 2011 and kind of the CM Punk pipe bombs thing leading up to it and the summer of punk and everything. But really the summer of punk didn't start properly until about November. That was when his kind of long title reign actually properly started. It didn't actually start at Money in the Bank. And the fact that WWE set up so many potential things here and then basically pulled all of them away from the audience, I think probably was a detriment to them in the long term. Anyway, just as Vince is about to fire John Cena, Triple H comes out and he basically says, look, Vince, I tried to get here sooner. I need a conversation with you. Can we do this in private in your office? Vince is like, no, we're all out here now. Come on, whatever you've got to say, get on with it. And Triple H very awkwardly, not awkward because it looks like he's acting awkward. Well, he is acting awkward, but he's doing it very well. Basically, he looks like he's in an awkward position, but he's doing a very good job of looking like he's in an awkward p position. And he explains to Vince that because of what's been happening recently and because of Vince's recent decisions, the board of directors have basically filed a vote of no confidence against him and removed him from his position of power and placed Triple H in charge of the day-to-day -day running of the company. So there will be no firing of John Cena. Vince, please basically go home and kind of have an early retirement, essentially. And initially, the crowd are kind of laughing this off and cheering, na 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 na, hey hey hey, goodbye, like they do. There's then a nice little heartfelt bit between Triple H and Vince McMahon more as kind of father in law and son in law rather than as kind of boss and employee or fellow kind of board members. And Vince is just welling up over all of this. Triple H leaves leaving Vince in the ring to kind of soak up the crowd what you would think is kind of one last time the crowd then applaud him and give him a thank you Vince chant just as he's kind of soaking it all in around him composing himself and, and kind of smiling to himself of saying well okay I did a lot here I accomplished a lot I guess it's kind of time for this to move on to the next stage and that is how the episode ends. Unfortunately, none of that really comes to fruition. Vince very much is still kind of involved in the day-to-day -day running, even now, eight years on. And it still feels like it needs some kind of a refresh, some kind of a new direction. The next week, Rey Mysterio does beat The Miz for the title. He then has to defend it against John Cena in the main event, and Cena wins the title back. And just as he's celebrating, back comes CM Punk. So, instead of being, oh, we're all in turmoil, what's going to happen at the end of Money in the Bank, to the end of this episode, where we think we're going to get a brand new champion... Uh, we're still not overly sure what's going to be happening with John Cena, although we can appreciate now he's not going to be getting fired. We've got Triple H coming into the play now, taking over from Vince McMahon. Vince McMahon kind of riding off into the sunset. We're still not necessarily sure what's going to be happening with CM Punk. And then a week after that, CM Punk's back, John Cena's back. They're both champions and they're going to face each other again at SummerSlam to basically unify the belts. And we never really see that change of direction that we were kind of promised. And it's a shame that we didn't kind of get CM Punk going on talk shows or radio shows or whatever with the belt. We didn't then keep Rey Mysterio as that champion on TV kind of there week to week defending it and then have CM Punk come back in a few months time maybe. We could have also put John Cena on the back burner for the time being because this was when he was very much sort of super Cena and people were getting sick and tired of him. The fact that the commentators were just constantly putting over this Cena Rock WrestleMania match as well it's almost like nothing else in the company mattered and come WrestleMania sure enough 
nothing really mattered. CM Punk as the champion didn't get his main event slot that he probably should have had. And effectively all that built up to was Rock and Cena again at WrestleMania 29, this time for the title, just to put Cena over and give him the belt back. So we never really progressed, even though it kind of felt like we were making small steps at the time. So there we go, that was the Raw after Money in the Bank 2011. I will be back with another Raw after next month, looking at the Raw after SummerSlam 1997. The SummerSlam where Shawn Michaels reluctantly counted the three count for Bret Hart to win his fifth WWF title over The Undertaker. But until next time, I have been that British guy and I will see you very soon. Goodbye.